open source framework for prototyping two-way satellite time and frequency transfer using SDR. So this is actually a research project uh, that is funded by quite a few agencies that you'll find on the concluding slide. Um, we're working on this with Gwen at uh, FM2ST in Besançon and our colleagues uh, Eric and Francois Meyer from the Besançon Observatory uh, in charge of the two-way satellite transfer for hardware. Uh, and in, uh, so this is a joint project with uh, CIRT Paris Observatory under the supervision of uh, Joseph Ashkar with uh, Michel Lours, uh, Maxime Dupont and, and others from uh, Paris Observatory. So what, what is uh, two-way satellite time frequency uh, about? So as I mentioned earlier, the current uh, universal coordinated time is the result of comparing multiple uh, atomic clocks around the world uh, using either uh, multiple techniques, uh, optical fiber links, this is the topic of Refimev that will be shown to you in uh, Sirius Observatory, uh, using GPS. GPS is not a timing standard, but using common view analysis, you can reject the impact of GPS and the unknown GPS time because USNO can do whatever it want with GPS time, but if you refer to uh, clocks to this common time frame, which is GPS, then you can subtract GPS from the equation and you still can have a comparison. And two-way uh, satellite time and frequency transfer uh, is the third technique for creating uh, UTC. And the basic technique is that if you've got these two dishes uh, pointing uh, at, in two different countries, possibly two different continents, if you're talking about North America and, you, and Western Europe, these two clocks can be compared by broadcasting a signal from one uh, observatory to the other uh, in order to compare their uh, clocks. And the challenge here is that the geostationary satellite, which is orbiting at 36,000 kilometers over the surface of the Earth, with a bit of delay because it's not exactly at the same uh, longitude, but it's over the Atlantic Ocean, midpoint, midway between Western Europe and North America, will take something, uh, so the distance is 39,000 kilometers, and you take the two-way trip, so the round trip of the wave from uh, the observatory to the next one, is something like 260 milliseconds. So obviously, you will not have sub-nanosecond uh, timing comparison if you already have a time delay of uh, um, something like 260 milliseconds. So the obvious solution, as done in White Rabbit, is to have a two-way measurement. So you, both speakers send the wave, both speakers look at the time they transmitted the signal and the time they receive a signal, and if all goes well, each one is measuring the time of flight, so you can subtract this common view observation and reject it from your equation. So when we were asked in uh, Besançon, could you make an open source, open, no, what we were asked is to make a software-defined radio uh, transceiver, and I translated this request as an open source, open hardware uh, software-defined radio transceiver for two-way satellite time frequency transfer. Um, that looked easy enough. Uh, we knew very well how to generate a pseudo-random sequence. We've been discussing at uh, GRCon 2021 how to make a noise radar. And when you want to measure time of flight or radar measurements, it's the same. You want to know the range to a target. It's the same story. So we knew how to do a pseudo-random sequence. We knew how to binary modulate, uh, binary phase shift key modulate a signal. We knew how to broadcast. So easy enough, in a month it's going to be finished and we can get the money and do something else. Except no one told us in the beginning of a project that the satellite is moving. When I'm told a geostationary satellite, I thought a geostationary satellite would be something fixed in space. And that's not the case, not when you were talking about sub-nanosecond uh, accuracy. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, this guy is moving by more or less plus or minus 75 microseconds. And this is the absolute pain. So here is an example of what the objective of this uh, work is. So we have something like four something megahertz bandwidth. This is allocated on Telstar 11N. So uh, the BIPM through NIST is paying for uh, a channel uh, on Telstar 11N for four dot something megahertz. So your bandwidth is constrained. You're, you cannot, of course you would say I want sub nanosecond easy enough. I broadcast two gigahertz and I have uh, a sub nanosecond uh, resolution. No, you're, you cannot do this because you're constrained by the bandwidth on the transponder. And this basically tells you that if you look at the spectrum of a, two point, of a BPSK signal, uh, you can broadcast at 2.5 megachips per second. Uh, 
a space standard that I discovered when I was working on this is that the intermediate frequency is 70 megahertz. So you would like your broadcasting system to generate a 70 megahertz, and then you can benefit from all the space communication hardware, including the up converters to go from the uh, intermediate frequency to the Q band at uh, 14 gigahertz uplink and 11 gigahertz downlink. Now, the frequency is generated by atomic clocks, and the downlink is uh, something that you observe. And the, t the frequency is driven by the atomic clock, and you, know, you need to know not only the frequency, but also the time. And the time is uh, one pulse per second. That's your standard also for GPS. And so it sounded obvious that if we were to generate our own pseudo-random sequence, I mentioned to you yesterday, SAT is using a 10,000 uh, bit long, uh, 10,000 chip long code. And I attributed this to uh, the technology of the 1980s. And I said, now it's 2023. We can make a 22 bit long, because 20 22 bit is more than 2.5 million, and that allows you to generate a one second long sequence, which solves your pulse repetition interval uh, uncertainty because with a 40 millisecond on a 260 uh, millisecond path, you have six pulses in space, traveling in space. So you, you have this modulo 40 millisecond measurement. And actually, at the beginning of this project, I was thinking, how do you actually solve this uncertainty? And I really had to pull hard to get the people to tell me, well, actually, we put this as a hard number in our equations. So we cannot solve it without knowing what is the location of uh, two speakers at both ends. So by using a one second long code, you actually solve the uncertainty of a pulse repetition interval in uncertainty. You have an absolute time transfer. And so how do we do this? Well, uh, Gwen will tell you more about the pseudo-random sequence generation. But the classical way of a Galois field linear feedback shift register is that you know that if you take one of these linear feedback shift register at each time step, you feedback a uh, wisely selected location of taps. And so these uh, 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 points over here. And XOR them to feedback into the input on the, on the left side of your register here. You will create a sequence with 2 to the n minus 1 long uh, non-repeating sequence. So that's your maximum length uh, m, m sequence. So here is an example of what we did with uh, Sartre measurement that I mentioned to you, the proprietary hardware from TimeTech. And the dots here are what we did with our software defined radio measurement. And you see that from a ranging perspective, we're not too wrong. So basically, the satellite over a couple of days is moving by plus or minus 30 kilometers. So that's plus or minus uh, 75 microsecond, 100, 150 microsecond excursion. And you see that our points on such a scale seem to fit pretty well the SAT uh, perspective. So project was finished. We could go to our next activities. Until we went a bit deeper into the story, and actually we wanted to do actual timing, not just ranging. And so the hardware to do this uh, is this uh, FPGA pseudo-random sequence generator. Gwen will be telling you about the various architectures. We have many options. This can be a standalone FPGA. This can be the B210 FPGA, because there's still a bit left space left. It can be the X310 FPGA. So this FPGA, I'm not defining what it is. But what we wanted to do is a full software-defined radio approach. So no external hardware, no intermediate frequency multiplication. So actually, the FPGA is on board generating the PPSK or QPSK uh, wave that will uh, ge generate the square wave on the GPIO. Of course, the GPIO is a square wave, so you've got 70, but you've got 210. You've got all the uh, e odd multiples of your signals, so you need a sharp filter here. This is a surface acoustic wave filter with basically 50 to 60 dB rejection of all the wanted modes, and you only propagate the 70 megahertz. And actually, this guy here we qualified in temperature. Uh, it's, it's kind of high loss filter. It's 25 dB loss. But the temperature stability is just amazing. Actually, I couldn't see the group delay shift uh, in a range from 0 to 40 uh, Celsius degree. And usually, you have this in uh, temperature control rooms. Uh, so you will not see a significant impact of the surface acoustic wave delay. The output of this signal is going to the broadcast up converter. And what's really important, as in noise radar, is you must have your reference signal if you want to know the time of flight. When you're doing ranging for radar signals, you need to know when your 
uh, pulse was broadcast, as was ex discussed yesterday in the ionospheric uh, measurement, if you want to know when the time of flight was. So here, you broadcast the signal that is sent on the up converter on the reference channel over here, and the received signal from the down converter will go on the uh, secondary channel. So what is mandatory in all this investigation is to have a coherent dual channel receiver, whether a B210 with its uh, AD9361 uh, uh, with two channels uh, clogged by the same local oscillator or the X310 with its basic RX uh, with uh, directly feeding uh, through the balloon the, the two A2D converters. So actually, my perspective is that this clock here does not need to be uh, metrological because actually you're going to reject any of these uh, fluctuations with respect to this clock. So the comparison will reject this guy. Of course, it has to be at least good enough not to fluctuate significantly during the 260 millisecond time of flight. The reason why we're doing ultra-stable clocks is that when you're asking a space probe what is your uh, Doppler shift, is your local oscillator is moving more than the Doppler shift by the space probe, then you don't know which one you're measuring. So here, our uh, time of flight is 260 milliseconds, so we're talking about a few hertz from carrier, so this clock here has to be good enough with respect to this time of flight, but it doesn't need to be metrological to reject this, its contribution. So I started with this story of one second long uh, pulse, uh, one second long code, and first of all, SAT is not using one second long. They have this pulse repetition, of, pulse repetition interval uncertainty. Second thing is, I thought, and this is Claudio Caloso correcting me uh, in my initial consideration, if you look at a classical radar cross-correlation match filter, you say you know what signal you sent, reference signal is X, and your match filter is a cross-correlation, so you get a time-delayed copy Y, and what you know from radar is that uh, because you multiply your measurement X by your measurement Y, this is voltage time voltage, this is a power, and the power will decrease the noise level as the number of samples. So what this tells you is the, more, the longer the code, the better your signal to noise ratio. Um, and if you do multiple measurements one after the other, if you have a Gaussian noise, you know that your standard deviation decreases as a square root of a number of uh, measurements. So in this case here, you're saying the signal to noise ratio improves as n, and the averaging decreases the noise as square root of n, so you conclude that the longer the code, the better it is, and hence my initial insight of using a one second long pseudorandom sequence. Now, what Claudio corrected me with is, in this case, we're not correcting with an observation of a transmitted noise, but this is a perfect known sequence. This is your code, your one and zeros. And in this case, you don't have a benefit of multiplying a voltage by a voltage, but you have a voltage time a constant. And in this case, because you know the code, well, your improvement in terms of signal to noise ratio is only the square root of n because you only have a voltage, you don't have a power with this uh, cross correlation. And so, on the one hand, you improve a signal to noise ratio with the square root of a code length, and on the other hand, the more measurements the ha you have because the shorter the code, then the uh, standard deviation decreases as square root of n, and these two guys compensate. And so we did a set of measurements. This is taking about one day. So this is a real measurement, two-way satellite transfer between Besançon Observatory and Paris Observatory, where we change the code length. And what you do see, this is the same uh, Allen deviation. So this is a time deviation this time uh, in the time domain. And what you do see is actually whatever the code length at a one second integration time, you end up getting the same noise level, which is 200 picoseconds. So you do have 200 picoseconds, whether you take a one second long code or the Satra modem 10,000 chip long, because at the end of the day, these two quantities cancel. And experiments show that indeed, the code length will not matter in the standard deviation of your, of your time fluctuation. So the, the performance of a time transfer is not the driving factor in selecting the code length. The Japanese who are working on this, they selected the GPS code, which is 2 to the 10, so 1,023 bit chip length. SAT was using 10,000. I provided a measurement for one second long, 2.5 million, and you see that at the end of the day, you've got 200 picosecond standard deviation. So that's, that's uh, uh, the one of the results. Now, uh, 
a few of you here in the room have been asking me, you're sampling at 5 megahertz. Inverse of 5 megahertz is 200 nanoseconds. And I claim to be measuring a standard deviation of 200 picoseconds. How do you go from 200 nanoseconds sampling period to 200 picoseconds standard deviation? And the trick is fitting the correlation peak. So you have a very strong assumption. You know that uh, in a Fourier transform, you're going from the time domain to frequency domain and samples, and from the frequency domain back to the time domain and samples. And this one-to-one -one relation tells you that uh, you cannot increase information by going for Fourier domain. Except if you make a very strong assumption, which is also what music or Capon is doing. So you think you know how many uh, correlation peaks you have or how many targets you have. And in this case, we know we have a single correlation peak, and so we can make an assumption that this correlation peak has a given shape. I will make the second order Taylor development. I will say it's just a stupid parabola. And if you say you have a parabola at the correlation peak, then you can demonstrate quite easily that you've measured a parabola maximum at index n. You know the two neighboring measurements, a minus 1 and n plus 1. The beauty here is that actually if you have periodic sampling uh, with time delay, uh, 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 equal time delay, then you have a formal equation that tells you, based on the measurements so of the height of a correlation peak and its neighbors, you can correct you can finally correct the position of a correlation peak by a quantity dn, which is given by this guy. I will not do the demonstration here. We can do it together. But this can improve your timing accuracy with a quantity equal to the signal-to-noise ratio of this correlation peak. Now, if you look at the uh, satellite link, your signal-to-noise ratio is something like minus 5 to minus 15 dB. That's not going to help us much. But you're doing a correlation here. And this correlation over n samples is improving your signal-to-noise ratio by 10 log n. And so typically for a 10,000 chip long uh, code, you will gain 40 dB. And this means that here you go from typically minus 10 dB signal-to-noise ratio plus 40 dB from your correlation peak. You have a 30 dB uh, signal-to-noise ratio over here. So this means you can gain a thousand-fold on the position. So you have 200 nanosecond sampling period, but thanks to the polynomial fit of this correlation peak, you actually improve a thousand-fold your knowledge of where the correlation peak is located. And this is how you go from two nano 200 nanosecond to 200 picosecond. Now, if you do this, what you see here, for example, is a ranging measurement. And this ranging measurement over three minutes, so typically our uh, measurement session lasts for three minutes, so one correlation peak every second gives you 180 correlation peaks. The slope that you see here is actually the, the, the satellite running away during the measurement. And you see that even though we have 200 nanosecond sampling period, we see very easily something like three nanoseconds per second. So this is typically the speed of your geostationary satellite running away uh, at typically maximum is five nanoseconds per second, and typically you will have something between plus or minus five nanoseconds per second. Now, as I was doing this, I told you I make a strong assumption. I say the correlation peak is a second order Taylor series of your uh, shape of your polynomial, and I do a parabola. But is the parabola correct? Well, what you actually see is that if I do this offset, so I take a linear fit, because you say the satellite is just running away linearly at uh, or three minutes, it's not going to change speed, you get these fluctuations. These are this curve blue over here minus the linear fit. And you're left with this periodic pattern here. And what is this periodic pattern? Well, this periodic pattern comes from your polynomial fit as you are moving. So these are your samples. The arrows are the time at which you do a measurement. And you see that your peak is actually slowly moving because the satellite is running away at a rate of 3 nanoseconds per second. And I have a sampling period of 200 nanoseconds. So 3 nanoseconds per second divided by, sorry, 200 nanoseconds divided by 3 nanoseconds per second means every 70 seconds, the parabola here is moving from one period to the neighbor. And as we're doing this, this is the maximum of a correlation peak. This is the neighbor on the left. This is the neighbor on the right. You see that you have different conditions, different signal to noise ratio conditions. Sometimes you're in the best situation where the maximum is uh, matching a uh, uh, sampling period and the two neighbors are very far away. So you have the best signal to noise ratio here. 
but sometimes you're in a very poor condition where you're right in the middle of two samples, and so you, these two guys are mostly at the same level, and the next one is at a very poor uh, level, at a very low level. And this is how I attribute the cause of these fluctuations, because what you do see is these fluctuations do match 200 nanoseconds sampling period divided by 3 nanoseconds per second is 62 uh, second period, and that actually matches the period of these fluctuations. What I do not understand, but it works, is the solution to this is to oversample. So oversampling means I artificially create two samples every uh, acquisition. So I oversample by a factor of three, and by oversampling the signal, you get the red curve. So oversampling, I'm not claiming I'm introducing any information by doing this, but the fact is that by oversampling your data, you're creating this red curve here where you cancel the fluctuations. So this is the trick that we're using to actually end up having 200 picosecond standard deviation after uh, this polynomial fit. So how do we actually implement the whole story either in GNU Radio or in uh, external processing software, in post-processing software. As was mentioned yesterday, there is a close match between convolution and correlation. Convolution is the integral of your measurement times uh, the filter with the time flicked over here. So what's important is the integration over time here has the opposite sign between one argument and the other. And from the convolution theorem, we know that you can efficiently calculate a convolution in the Fourier domain as the product of the Fourier uh, uh, elements. Now, if you go to correlation, the little trick is that uh, now the integral, uh, the time is in the same direction for both arguments. And how do you flip time of this guy over here? Well, you actually take a complex conjugate of a, comp of a second Fourier transform. So you can easily calculate your correlation in the Fourier domain. Why is this interesting? Uh, first of all, because uh, the fast Fourier transform is an n log n computation intensive calculation instead of n squared. That's one benefit. But here you have another benefit, is that you get the oversampling for free. You get the oversampling for free because when you take the Fourier transform, you start with n samples over here. So you get a Fourier transform of n samples. And by zero padding, you add in the Fourier domain the two n zeros at both ends. And when you go back in the inverse Fourier transform, you just got three n samples in the time domain. So actually, we're doing the zero padding or the interpolation in the Fourier domain, and that allows uh, avoiding this fear filter that is always very annoying. And actually, what you show is that you have optimal uh, zero padding, uh, optimal interpolation by doing it into the Fourier, uh, Fourier domain. So this is actually what the algorithm looks like at the end. So you sample the IQ samples from the uh, downlink of a satellite. You, on the first hand, you take the uh, frequency offset to compensate for any frequency uh, difference between the local oscillator and the satellite oscillator, because actually the transceiver, I'm going to show you in the next slide, the transceiver on the satellite introduces a random frequency fluctuation. You cannot say anything about the behavior of the transceiver on the satellite. So you must detect the frequency offset that was introduced by the satellite. I do this by squaring the signal, getting rid of the BPSK, taking the Fourier transform. And with respect with what you saw yesterday about the, uh, uh, the SARSAT measurement, well, while I'm doing this, I can take an FFT as long as I want. And the FFT, uh, as long as I want, gives you as high a resolution as you want on the frequency offset, except uh, for the calculation uh, uh, load of this FFT. So you take the maximum of the argument, you know the delta frequency, and you compensate for a local oscillator. Of course, this is a numerically controlled oscillator, so it's a perfect oscillator. Then you take the Fourier transform of the output of this guy. You take the Fourier transform of your code. This is pre-computation, because this can be done in advance. You you do the multiplication, so you're here in the frequency domain. You do your zero padding for interpolation, inter, inter, um, inverse Fourier transform, and you search for the maximum of your correlation peak. And what we do here is you've got the two neighbors plus uh, the maximum, the neighbor on the left, the neighbor on the right, parabolic fit, and this gives you the maximum of your measurement. What I'm going to show you in a second is actually I need a second copy of a rotated code to match the code and get a power and signal to noise ratio measurement that also is uh, uh, input from Claudio Caloso, where you actually take the signal to noise ratio as the signal resulting from the correlation of the code with a received signal, and the noise is just a standard deviation uh, sigma squared of, of your measurement. So, and that will give you the SNR, uh, which is a quantity that uh, Spacelink people uh, enjoy having. So this is. Uh, 
an example of a measurement over three days of the downlink frequency. So here I canceled the 11 gigahertz of the 10.9 something gigahertz, and I removed the 70 megahertz. The 70 megahertz, remember, is metrological. So unless our cesium clocks are completely wrong, the 70 megahertz is perfect. And so what you're left here is the frequency offset introduced by the transponder on the satellite. You uplink 14 gigahertz, you downlink 11 gigahertz, and you're left, when you're doing all the same thing, with a fluctuation fluctuation of plus or minus 100 hertz. So you see a daily fluctuation, and if Joseph Ashkar was here, he would show you as well, you have a, uh, uh, a seasonal fluctuation. And to tell you the truth, we have no idea, at least I have no idea uh, why a satellite is changing, whether it's its temperature, whether it's, it's, uh, it is its uh, power uh, input. Uh, I see no reason why a geostation satellite has a seasonal behavior, but it's a fact that you have something like a, a 150 hertz daily fluctuations, and Joseph would, tell you, would show you that uh, you have a seasonal variation of a something like plus or minus one kilohertz. Uh, no idea why that is, but it's a fact. So what you see here is these frequency fluctuations, so never rely on the carrier frequency to try to recover information. You can only rely on the time delays of your codes, but the frequency is fluctuating by this unknown guy that you, have don't, you don't have access to unless you have a very good space shuttle. So you will not know what the frequency of a transponder is. But still, what I want to show you is it doesn't matter. Because when you're doing the correlation, as we showed yesterday on, on the SARSAT measurement, if you have a huge frequency excursion, you need to compensate for the frequency offset, which is larger than the inverse of the duration of your integral. But if your frequency offset is small enough, you degrade the signal-to-noise ratio, but you don't prevent the coherent accumulation in your uh, correlation. So what you want is that this frequency offset is much smaller than the duration of a code. So if you have a one-second long code, your frequency offset must be much smaller than one hertz. But if you have a 10,000 chip code, 40 milliseconds, you just need a frequency offset that is better than 250 hertz. And that's easily achievable with your FFT. And what I'm showing in this simulation here is that unless you have a huge frequency offset, you're really very bad at identifying the frequency, it will not impact the position of a correlation peak. It will impact the signal to noise ratio, but not the position. So I just, in this simulation, you can repeat it if you want to have fun. This is uh, Octave software. But what I'm showing is that you get something like a position of a correlation peak, which is 5, 10 to the minus 6 samples, arbitrary unit samples. And if you transpose this to your uh, 5 mega sample per second, so 200 nanosecond, this is a 2 picosecond fluctuation. So the frequency offset of a downlink, if you poorly identify it, if you're not too poorly identifying it, it will create two picoseconds. This is much, much lower than our standard deviation, which uh, at the moment is something like 200 picoseconds. So frequency offset is not the cause of our problem. What is the cause of our leftover problem? You've got these two guys located in case of Besançon in Paris, something like 500 kilometers away, and they claim to be measurement, measuring the same signal. But how can I make sure that we wake up at the same time in Paris and in Besançon? And especially UHD is taking, from my experience, basically a random amount of time to initialize your USRP. X310 will initialize quite quickly. The B210 will take forever. Five, six seconds is forever for me. And um, so you never know. You start your two scripts at the two ends of a link at the NTP time. NTP plus or minus 100 milliseconds, more or less. You hope, as we were discussing yesterday, that you're not going to be right on the PPS, because then you will be at two different seconds. And you tell the UHD, now start the acquisition. And this takes a random amount of time. OK, let's say it takes up to six seconds. So after 10 seconds, you tell your FPGA, start broadcasting the code. So you know you have a first message. But if you make a mistake, plus or minus one second, well, the satellite is moving by 75 microseconds every day. So you can do a quick simulation. So this is the number of seconds per day times 75 microseconds. And you say you were mistakenly offset by one second between the two ends. So you do acquire the same data in Besançon in Paris, but you made a mistake by one second. Well, you already have plus or minus five nanoseconds. And if you make this mistake randomly, it will not be a beautiful sine wave, but it will be sometimes here, sometimes here. If you're lucky enough that the, just the satellite is turning around, it will not impact. But if you're at the maximum speed of a satellite, this is the worst case. You get five nanosecond offset due to this one second delay in your measurement. And if you're very bad, 
they say Besançon is one second to the right and Paris is one second to the left. You have two second offset. Well, you get 10 nanoseconds. Remember, we're aiming at 200 picoseconds. So we need to synchronize the two ends to better than one second. And this is where the code length has an impact because a very long code length, well, it's difficult to know if you're off by one second. With a 40 millisecond code length, you've got so many copies, uh, actually 25 per second, uh, 20, 250 per second, that you can finely tune your frequency offset. And actually, if you do calculation with a such 40 millisecond at a rate of uh, at a rate of 5 nanoseconds per second, you actually end up having an error of 200 picosecond. So this is documented nowhere. You would find no article telling you why they selected 10,000 chips. But I'm pretty sure that this is the reason. 200 picosecond is a standard deviation they aim for, and 200 picosecond happens to be the frequency of the time offset that you create if you make a mistake by one chip on a satellite moving by five nanoseconds per second. So we struggled a lot because um, when, so these are each individual measurement, this is, for example, in Besançon, this is in Paris, this is the time offset as a function of time, and you see that they are moving, which is no problem because the satellite is running away. So what you're seeing here is a satellite moving in space. I just find it fascinating that from ground I can see a satellite moving by something like by a meter per second at 36,000 kilometers. So these are what these curves are showing you. And when you subtract these two guys, if you're correct, well, you should cancel the motion of a satellite, and this should be flat. Uh, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's not. And so the first thing is, when it's not flat, one cause is because we're not well aligned. The second thing is, well, at the moment, what we did is we introduced, so Gwen added in his FBGA, a timestamp that flips to tell, this, to tell us this is the first code of a second. And this allows us to align to one second. But if you're doing this, well, again, you remember yesterday I told you I have my local copy of a code, and if just the bit is flipping and my code is right in between, the energy will not accumulate coherently in between, and I will have a poor signal-to-noise ratio over here. So the second thing is, as Claudio mentioned, make sure that you do align properly your local code, and this is your classical prompt early and late uh, uh, feedback loop on your position of a code. So at the end, you do get your bits, and you can actually get the, uh, the right alignment. So this is actually very similar to what we saw yesterday about the time alignment. Um, what it looks like at the end, and you will find the same kind of, so uh, Cyril mentioned this about his synchronization. You'll see probably the same if people talk to, talk to you about White Rabbit. So you've got these two guys at the two ends who have their own clocks, and they need to align their measurements to have a common time frame. So what we do have here is NTP triggering at the two ends the acquisition, uh, but well, first of all, NTP plus or minus 100 milliseconds, that's not so good. And secondly, you've got this random starting delay when UHD, you tell UHD start acquiring, but by the time the X310 understand what you told it, uh, it's a few seconds, and by the time the, two B, the B210 understand what you told it, it's even more. So here you've got the start of the acquisition, but if you know that this is maximum delay, then you start broadcasting the information from the FPGA a bit later, and on each uh, time frame, this is starting randomly, this is starting randomly, the uh, transmission from Paris is starting over here, but it takes a bit of time to get to Besançon, so the time is delayed by 260 milliseconds. Besançon is starting over here, takes 250, 260 milliseconds to get to Paris, and well, Paris and Besançon don't know what is their common time frame, they have their own local clock, so what you actually see on your record is I have my first sample over here, and I know I have exactly one sample every 200 nanoseconds, but I need to realign these two guys. And if this alignment is not done properly, this is where you get your leftover fluctuation. So that, that's what I'm struggling with at the moment, to, to try to align this data set properly. Now, if you're not careful enough, the reason why we actually discovered this issue of alignment is we were looking with Claudio at our measurements, and I had two ways of doing my correlation. One way was to say, I take code length pieces of my file, so code length bits in my uh, IQ chips in my, in my file, and I process by little chunks of data. And the other approach was to say, I take one second of data, I do a big correlation over one second, and analyze my correlation by bits by bits. And I didn't get the same result. 
And well, the important conclusion about this story is, remember, you're doing the correlation in the free domain and doing a, uh, an analysis in the free, discrete time free domain assumes the periodicity of a spectrum. So is it correct to say over one second, the end over here is the same as the beginning over here? This is the important aspect. A correlation calculated in the frequency domain assumes the periodicity on the left and on the right. And what triggered Claudio's discussion is that this last chip over here is not at the same level as the others. I had not noticed. I had just said, okay, it's not, not too bad, look. And the reason why you have this last chip that is not at the same level as all the others is that at a one second duration, I have a bit of a leftover frequency offset. And this leftover frequency offset means that if you don't look at the magnitude, but if you look at the real part and imaginary part of the correlation, you see that the correlation over here, the real part, is not the same as over here. And so the energy will not accumulate coherently. And this concludes the same story as my colleague uh, uh, Enrico Rubiola already concluded for correlations in a, a phase analysis. Don't look at the magnitude. Magnitude is hiding so much information. Look at the real part, imaginary part. Of course, it's so much more annoying because if you look at the real part, imaginary part, you get a correlation that is negative and people hate negative correlations, exactly, especially if you're selling Rod and Schwartz instruments. You don't want to show uh, to people negative logarithmic quantities. But actually, the real life is that a real part of a correlation will give you much more information because you get the phase of a correlation and it's a very important quantity. And what you see here is that we're missing this guy here is over here because it's correlating with this guy. So actually, this guy is the same phase as this one, whereas you've got this phase rotating slowly. And this mismatch is the cause for this guy being too small. So you must absolutely align the code. So you have your free running code, and the day you start seeing the code being broadcast by the other guy on the other side of a link, make sure that you align your code. And then you get your beautiful correlation peak, whether in magnitude or whether in real imaginary part, in real part, it will not change the signal to noise ratio. But I would really advise you to look at real part of correlation and not magnitude. So at the end of the day, this is what it looks like. So this is a measurement we did. I don't want to go in the details of this software. Of course, it's, there's no point. But I just want for this audience to relate these equations that usually don't mean anything. At least to me, equations are very difficult to translate into actual software. And I just want to take a few seconds to show how, with Claudio, we ended up doing a relevant signal-to-noise ratio measurement. So we do take our data that we frequency shift. Frequency shifting means you have discrete time. Uh, so sampling period uh, equals sampling period. And you create your local oscillator as j2 pi, the frequency offset, scalar quantity times the vector of time. And you frequency offset by multiplying your measurement with your local oscillator. We know that the correlation is calculated in frequency domain. You take the Fourier transform of your quantity, assuming you already pre-calculated the frequency transform of a code. So you calculate the correlation as the frequency domain code multiplied by the conjugate of a frequency domain measurement, and you do your zero padding. Zero padding, you add zeros on both ends of this guy over here, and then you can take the IFFT because you go back to time domain, but now you have three times more samples. You do the same on your uh, code over here because later we will have a copy of our uh, data with the same interpolation. So you interpolate the data the same way you interpolated the correlation. And then you actually, for each step, each length of a code length, you do this search for the maximum of the absolute correlation. And once you found the maximum value of a correlation, you look for the two neighbors, the one on the left, the one on the right, and you do the little trick I just showed you of calculating the uh, correction. So this correction over here is this parabolic fit between the two neighboring correlation peaks. Once you got the correlation peak position, you can rotate the code accordingly. So you rotate so that the two codes are properly aligned, and you say your real part and imaginary part of a signal to noise ratio will be the multiplication of the code multiplied by the data, and the noise is the variance of the measurements. So you, you got your signal, you got the noise, so the signal to noise ratio is equal to the ratio of these two, quanti of these two quantities. If you want to go through this by yourself, you've got the GitHub over here uh, on OSKIM Digital on uh, GRSAT. This is the repository where I put the files. And you can see the Claudio Align code, which is this software that you can run on the uh, data that are stored on this repository. 
Uh, what you see here is a week of measurements between Paris and Besançon. Uh, it starts with a given power, so the uh, yellow dots are the measurements from the SDR, and in, uh, sorry, the blue and red dots are measurements from the SDR, and the yellow dots in Paris, they have a power probe at the focal point of their parabola. So they have an absolute measurement of a power, and that's the yellow dots. Now, as we were doing measurements between Besançon and Paris, there was a hardware failure at some point, and Paris started broadcasting a bit less power, actually 10 dB less. And what you actually see here is that the SDR with our estimator show very nicely this drop by 10 dB. The mistake was corrected a bit later, so you see in yellow the power probe at the focal point of a Paris dish, and in blue and red the power drop that we observed using our estimator over here. So it seems to work. So this is what it actually looks like in new radio. We did the demonstration with Gwen yesterday. I will not go again through it, but if you want to do it by yourself under new radio, you've got your USRP source going through the Costas loop, taking the Fourier transform of the measurement, taking the Fourier transform of the code that you, that you broadcast, multiply, conjugate, inverse Fourier transform, and that you get your time domain correlation peak. No broadcast, the correlation peak does not show any correlation value, the phase is just random. When you start broadcasting, you get your correlation peak, and your correlation peak are separated by the pulse repetition interval, which is given by the code length. Now the phase is nicely rotating, and if you zoom into your phases, you got, so this is before the Costas loop, of course, with respect to Thomas' presentation. Uh, this is before the Costas loop, so you see nicely the bit shift of uh, 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 pseudo-random sequences and the, frequent, and the offset. This is a real part, so you have a cosine of a phase which is uh, rotating over here. So you see nicely that this is working, even though new radio will not have a correlation between two quantities, you can very easily do it using the free approach. So to conclude this presentation, we think we demonstrated a two-way satellite time frequency link between uh, Seared Paris Observatory and uh, Besançon Observatory. We identified, I think, key parameters, code length, timing accuracy. We do have a functional implementation, including a uh, correlation inversion uh, at the beginning of each second to mark the second. All software is readily available. Gwen is going to show you in his next presentation how he's working on the FPGA to implement all this, so don't ask me about the FPGA. Work in progress, how do we add uh, additional information? How do we add timestamp? How do we add these quantities I mentioned to you related yesterday to allow for one-way uh, time uh, transfer? Uh, impact of uh, code length in terms of SNR consideration. Um, so these are the additional features that we wish to uh, improve. This is a measurement. It's not state of the art, but it shows you that over four days, we did do two-way time transfer every odd hour where we can do testing with something that's fluctuating by standard deviation is 200 picoseconds state of the art, but fluctuations of plus or minus five nanoseconds, unacceptable. We need to find a solution, work in progress. SNR measurements. And we conclude this by uh, thanking the funding agencies. First CF is funding Gwen's salary. Uh, LNE is funding the uh, project. And this is all open source software because it's done with your money. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for the talk. I had a question on slide eight with the um, interpolation of the correlation um, and this uh, oscillating pattern and the flat one. So the, so the second graph, so you have the, um, the red curve. Um, so you said you're interpolating, uh, so it's the signal you're interpolating before computing the correlation? Yes. So um, I don't really understand why it seems so weird to you that you obtain the flat curve, because I guess this interpolation, um, well, it means that the interpolation is better than the uh, parabolic fit, because it takes into account the... Um, the, the, I would say the properties of the of the signals, and isn't it simply a, a matter of um, the, the fit of the parabola, which doesn't take that into account? To me, my understanding is that when you interpolate, you don't create information. You're not adding any information. You're just zero padding. It looks good, but you're not adding information. So to me, this means that this fluctuation is not intrinsic to the signal. It's an artifact of a parabolic fit. Parabolic True, fit. Yeah. So it's either numerical instability, because we're talking about 13 decimals behind the, the calculation. So I just emphasize this. I mean, it's strange because it's not intrinsic to the signal, it's intrinsic to the parabolic fit calculation. And it means either you have to be very careful with the number of decimals, working with double float instead of single float. It's, this means to me it's a numerical artifact and not intrinsic to the signal. That's okay. what I meant. 
Okay, I would say that the, the blue curve is really the artifact of the parabolic fit. Yeah. But if you have a very high uh, SNR, I would say that the interpolation uh, might be good. And so the, in this case, you, you may end up with the, this red curve, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the correct interpolation. No? So this, this is totally right. But the, the point is like what the interpolation does is, is we're going back to the sampling theorem. Basically, we assume that every sampling instant, we put a sink shape, and it has a zero in every other sampling instant, right? So if we interpolated with a sink instead of a parabola, then we, 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 didn't get, we wouldn't get this, this aberration there. But we're not doing that. We're taking this, the sink, and we're cutting it off after the second Taylor series element. And I honestly didn't remember that, so I looked it up. It's like the, the Taylor series is a minus 1 to the power of... Uh, index times x to 2, the exponent, divided by the um, uh, faculty of the, the index. And if we're cutting off after a second, we are losing everything above um, like 1 divided by 6. So we have a lot of error there. And that's just showing there. And, and if we do like a better Taylor approximation, we are achieve the same. But doing the perfect approximation would be doing the sync, right? And how do we do a sync? Well, we do a rectangle and transform it, right? And what is that? We're just taking the samples, we're adding zeros um, to them in the time uh, frequency domain, and then we transform them back. And that's exactly what happens. And 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 that's that's the interpolation that you do. And so this is this is really nice. Like math kind of works sometimes. That's why I'm giving presentations to get answer to my problem. <laughs> <laughs> this seems to be a high effort. Write an email. <laughs> Uh, so I have played with uh, this parabolic interpolation in the past as well. And um, one of the things I've learned is that um, if you do uh, just the parabolic int interpolation, you end up with a gain of 50 to maybe, if you're really lucky, 100. And that's not going to be enough for you're trying to get three orders of magnitude out of it. And if you go back to your uh, publication by Gassior from CERN, uh, he suggests not, not using a, a parabolic, but actually doing a Gaussian window and then on the Gaussian window, uh, that means your parabolic, you, you, you now do the parabolic over the logarithm, logarithm of your data, and then you can get actu actually gains up to 8,000. Okay. I, I did not discuss your windowing. Uh, I, I, I'm showing you everything with a, a rectangular window, but the fact is that I did try uh, windowing these quantities, yes. Definitely. Okay, thank you. Sure. 